Support for this episode of the PowerCast comes from HowMuchYouBench.net, home of Mark Bell's Slingshot. Bench heavy with no pain with Mark Bell's Slingshot. Apparel for strong people at 8manstrong.com and Bodybuilding.com. Bodybuilding.com is the world's largest fitness website and supplement store. Bodybuilding.com has free fitness plans for every level. Visit Bodybuilding.com today to become your best self. Hey, this is Jim McDonald. Welcome to episode 183 of the PowerCast. This episode is Josh Bryant. Josh was the youngest person to bench 600 pounds in competition at 22 years of age. So he is uh, exceptionally strong and very much built for benching, but he's put a lot of effort into the other lifts as well. He's also a uh, very well-known sought-after coach. Uh, this particular episode is very much in the strength training vein, so you will learn a lot about a lot of different approaches and all the coaches that he's worked with over the years who have influenced him. I will, however, say that this thing, this little card right here that you see, uh, was stronger than all of us because it took camera two out altogether. This, this file is corrupted, and so... We are single camera for this episode. Since nobody knows when we went multi-cam in the first place, I don't feel so bad about having one episode that's uh, just single cam. Anyway, enjoy this episode, like and share, and we'll see you back next week. Training Gym in West Sacramento, California. This is Mark Bell's PowerCast. Alongside Silent Mike and Jim McDee, here's your host, Mark Bell. Here, Mario, where'd you go? Mario, we're starting. <laughs> the meatloaf. Anyway, we're here today with Jailhouse Strong. What the hell's this guy's name? Josh something? Josh Bryant? Are you related to Kobe? Well, Kobe we did. look alike, so we yeah. confuse a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was confused. Both of you guys hanging off a rim quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both can jump well, yeah. Josh Bryant is uh, famous for getting people really fucking strong, but before he did that, he was throwing around some crazy weights himself. He still throws around some crazy weights, but he's the youngest person, I believe. Uh, you know, this is one of these things. It's like got an asterisk next to it because it's like <laughs> youngest in recorded history. You know, there may have been other uh, people who've done it, but uh, nobody has proof of it except for him. Paleolithic era, the bench pressing was big. Yeah, <laughs> yeah see? <laughs> Youngest 600-pound uh, bencher ever, I believe, at 21 years 22. old. He did s 22 years old. I got someone next week, 21, that's going to eclipse it, though. He did a 600-pound bench. Um, Larry Wheels has benched 605, six, 605, 605 in, in the training, gym. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not officially and in what's competition. He? Yours, was in, yours was done in competition? Yeah. And he's, Larry's he's 21. 21. Yeah. Uh -oh. Larry's really <coughs> fucking explosive. Yeah. And yes, he, might he is. Be, yeah. And he might be 21 for the next three or four years. So <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. A lot of your records are might, might fall. Yeah. Uh, what That's... about the squat? What's, what's your best raw squat? Um, I didn't do raw squat so much in meets back then because it was more like equipped, but I yeah. did 909 in the USPF, and I've Damn. done – Raw? So it's yeah. Choose. Oh, no, not raw. No, no, no. Oh, I've done single hit. ply, walked out, knee wrap. I've right? done oh, seven, so 780 um, very deep um, with no wraps, sleeves, yeah. or anything. Just I saw a video. Like, you posted an old video. I think you squatted 800 off, like, a 12-inch box Seven or 700 off a 9-inch box. Pause. Nine-inch box? Yeah, yeah. That's, like, yeah. onto a shoe. Yeah. That's amazing. Mike would have to use a 9-inch cock, so he'd have the motivation <laughs> to get down yeah. in there. Big old dildo back there. <laughs> Where's the willers away? That's right. <laughs> Damn, that's strong. And uh, what about poles? Yeah. Deadlift? Um, I've done 810 officially raw. Strong. Mm -hmm. And then that's actually my most proud feet because um, I'm not built well for deadlifting. Yeah, yeah. Short, I mean, stubby arms. If you're, like, genetically set up for a lift, you, you damn well better be good at it. But right. you got to overcome some stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you also – your brother's also really strong and, mm -hmm. and super athletic. He was a shot putter for USC. Yeah. He, he won the NCAA twice. Oh, damn. He was on the world team in, in Japan. And Holy crap. No, for America in Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How much, uh, how much did he get up in body weight? Because to throw the shot, I um, imagine you have to be pretty big, right? I think he's thrown his furthest about 255, 260. He, mm. he, uh, blew That's kind of different, right? Aren't a lot yeah, of guys Yeah, is that a little small? Well, he's way stronger. Mm. I mean, because he was cleaning close to 500 pounds. We got the video oh on YouTube. God. And, you know, he's benching at touch and go 560. So, I mean, he's so strong Holy that he was shit. able to get better speed that yeah. way. Yeah, I've seen him do a bunch of, like, uh, plyo jumps and box jumps. And exactly. Stuff. Super athletic. 
And he ballooned up for a while to like. I love that term. Ballooned up. <laughs> ballooned up. <laughs> he really ballooned up. Like Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Yeah, like two ninety to three hundred. Yeah, really yeah. blowed it up. He wasn't as effective then. Yeah. Slowed yeah. Down. When you ballooned up, it's not muscle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You never it's, ballooned up to a really hard. Yeah. Jack. Said he swelled, <laughs> swelled up. It's yeah. Kind of different. No. Yeah. Oh, he, man, the guy really swelled up. He got jacked and became three hundred pounds, he or he up. ballooned up to three hundred. Off the wagon. Now he's like two thirty. Looks like a bodybuilder. So. What's he doing now? Um, I think he should do some sort of natural bodybuilding contest, but mm-hmm. we'll see if he does it. But he has yeah. like the look. Yeah. So he yeah, do uh, being, power being involved with uh, NC NC two A and stuff. He probably yeah. had to always stay clean, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> he do any powerlifting or anything? Just um, uh, the lifts for he throwing. did a meet last year, and he did um, five oh seven in the bench <coughs> raw, Jesus. and he deadlifted. Um, he got up. It was there 700 or 705 on pot. It was officially in a meet. I don't recall if it was 700 or 705. Where's your so. strength come from? Fucking old Papa Bryant out there or Grandpa so-and-so? Probably somewhat. We started really young, too. So, you know, you got to understand, like, I was lifting at five years you old in my garage. bailing hay or what happened? Yeah, you were no, in Santa lift. Barbara, California. <laughs> <laughs> Sipping wine and surfing. <laughs> Universal machine in the garage first. There, and there you go. Cement yeah. weights in the backyard and then... Um, at 12 years old, I was fully retraining at the YMCA already. So oh, there you go. And then my brother was nine, and he'd come with me, and we were workout <laughs> partners. Were your parents into lifting, or what, what made you my, start so young? My dad was All-American in the hammer throw. Okay. So he was into lifting, but back then, um, I mean, he it was probably always pretty big. Yeah, he was. He So he was not on our strength level. I think if he could have, like, had some proper guidance, right. you know, he... He would just lift. Yeah. He just lift and just and just throw the hammer and just happen to be world champion. <laughs> That's <laughs> happen to whoop, whoop up on everybody. Um, so, where did you develop some of these principles? Like more recently, you know, the jailhouse strong. Like, what's the jailhouse strong? Hey, are you a criminal in, in the first place? Uh, depends what you define a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a jailhouse strong is basically um, how to how to maximize results with minimal equipment. Um, so, gotcha. it's very good for people that have like access to just barbells, you know, body weight, things like that yeah. and how to maximize it and use methods. Then it goes further and basically runs on a continuum. So we got your body weight training. If you do not have access to weights, how do you get as muscular, strong and effective as possible? Here's what to do with your body weight. Okay. Now you have access to yeah. basic barbells and things. Here's the pig iron program for various days a week on the basic equipment. Then you pig have iron. whatever the hell you want. Like, you know, we got the specialization programs yeah. for like arms and things like that. Yeah, like you know, I see a lot of the posts that you make. They're they're etched in like kind of classical strength. You mm-hmm. know, like you kind of bring up you know that there's so many different methods uh, even within just having a barbell. You got isometric training. You got tempo training. Uh, you can go fast. You can go slow. I mean, there's so many different things that you can do. And then even within that, um, or even aside from that. You can just take away a barbell completely and do body weight stuff that could really annihilate you. I see you posting pictures of, you know, guys doing neck bridges with tons of weight on their chest yeah. or like these different old school movements. What attracts you to some of that? Well, I think it's a lot. Large part of it is um, just the when I grew up. Like I know you were into wrestling and stuff too, so yeah. that's a little more classical. That's what got me into it is watching wrestling, seeing like Paul Orndorff on TV. Yeah. So th- that, uh, the people that got me a into great it. Great video going around of him going around the gym yelling at everybody, doing leg oh, yeah. extensions, leg curls. He's all oiled up. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that was funny. Yeah, I didn't exactly <laughs> what talking about. And then um, the people that taught me how to lift were more old school. I've been mentored by like Fred Hatfield, <laughs> Eddie Cohn, people like that. And then not, I've not read bad people to be yeah, mentored no. by. I've read a lot of books that, are, that I've had to work very hard to get that are out of print and stuff to learn every, everything I can. So not just to, like, um, blow in the wind to what the newest trend is, kind of actually look at, you know, what the old school is, yeah. what science says, and kind of synergistically blend what goes. Yeah, I saw some of the stuff you were writing about uh, that Tookie Williams, a, a lifelong gangster, I guess, yeah. right? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Well, so we did Jailhouse Strong. Uh, me and my partner on Jailhouse Strong, Adam Benchia, we had to um, do a lot of research. This wasn't just like um, a lot of – there's been a couple other like prison systems. They're either like under pen names or they're just like – or they're just like, you know, some lawyers in a garage just watching reality TV making things up. This is like legit <laughs> because we actually went down to South Central L.A. and went in like – we got the videos on YouTube that like have interviewed like Barefoot Pookie and other people that were like leaders of the Crips. Actually went into their apartments – what would not be maybe the best idea for your personal safety <laughs> right. and actually did these interviews and talked to all these different peoples. We talked to like, you know, then for like the self-defense, we talked to George Christie, the guy that's like the, 
former leader of the Hells Angels, mm-hmm. all these sorts of people that, Crazy. that other people may not want to talk to. <laughs> we're not. This isn't a moral judgment. This is like what's going to be the most effective way. Like yeah. if someone attacks you, how do you react? Okay, yeah. well, self-defense. This is what George Christie says. How did you kind of get wind of some of this? Did you hear like that these guys were lifting some crazy weights in jail? And then you were like, well, shit. Like they probably didn't have a lot of equipment. Let me find out more about well, it. There was this, the, for, initially the interest started when we were in high school. There was a couple bouncers from the local, um, like, nudie bar. I love it. That come I love, in there. I love this is so amazing. And this is were, so Poughkeepsie. This is, like, where I fucking grew up. Same shit. Yeah, so these dudes would come in there, and we're, like, I was working the front desk of the gym, like, 16 years old, and they knew the guy that was, like, working with me, Steve Hall, and they wanted to get tips from him. So The names to, are the best. They'd too. have to come. We got Mike Paisano where I'm from. Yeah. Mike, we used to say that Mike Paisano was such a badass that yeah. he's not even Mike Paisano. Okay. Mike Paisano is not even Mike Paisano. Was the same. Well, they so. wanted access to Steve Hall and his information. He was, like, taking me under his wings. So they'd yeah. always come up and be nice to me and talk to me, like, what's Steve think about this? And I'd tell him. And then, in turn, they'd kind of, like, take us under their wing, let us hang out with them at the right. gym. And there were these huge guys that had just got out of prison. <laughs> they bring in other people that had gotten out of prison. Everybody was Everybody jacked. thought it was cool. <laughs> and they were training like basic barbell yeah. lifts. You know, like my, the first time I saw a mechanical advantage drop set, like you have, you know, your friends with Paula Quinn, he's yeah. big into those. It was from these guys. Yeah. The dumbbells only went to 130 pounds. They're doing inclines. Failure, drop it, failure, drop it. You know, things mm-hmm. like that that I saw with my own eyes and just seeing all every, their cast of characters, all ex-cons, all yeah. jacked, all huge. Had a light bulb went off, you know. Right. Yeah, they're not like biomechanic majors. They're no. just fucking using what they have, and they're yeah. getting stronger. Exactly. Pushing their bodies to the limits. How did you find out some of the names in particular uh, <laughs> of like the lead gangsters or self defense guys? Like, it's one thing. Even nowadays, you understand. Like, well, maybe it is different now because jails. I heard uh, took away a lot of weight rooms and stuff. But yeah. you know, even me growing up, you're like, oh yeah, yeah guys. Going to jail and then or Gucci Man. Gucci Man's a rapper. He went into jail all fat and then he came out all jacked. And you're like, all right, like yeah. that's what happens. And they're doing bench and chin ups and some of the basics. But how'd you find out like this guy right here? I need to go interview him because he knows what's going on. Because I think uh, amongst convicts that have like hit the pig iron in prison, there's a great oral tradition. So they're going. What's pig iron prison? What is that? What's an oral tradition? <laughs> <laughs> Meaning they'll tell you who was who was what oral and anal traditions <laughs> in Meaning, the jailhouse strong programming <laughs> system. Meaning it's who, only a three week block. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it's the reason you got to be jailhouse strong. Yeah. That's right. right. Competition's pretty stiff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clinch up the old butt cheeks. <laughs> no, they just say they, they talk about it, so you can do like your own research, and and it's not like people are beating down the doors to talk to these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's easy to access them once Very you figured out access. who it was. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a celebrity per se. No, people <laughs> most people are running the other way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, didn't didn't you mention uh, some of the rest pause method kind of came out of some of that? Yeah. So what um so again more names like Tukey was training with a guy <laughs> named Big Jack. And they were training his backyard. So they'd like they'd hit the weights twice a day. They'd go there, hit it, go eat Mr. Jim's barbecue, come back, lift again. <laughs> so the, what they would do, they'd have like three benches set up. They'd do as many reps as they could in this one, rate right about fifteen seconds, the next one, the next one. Right. So all these different guys, like Michael Christian, all these different guys. Oh, they just had each bench set up that way. But it's the same sort of principle if you right. just right, right, right. set up. Uh, so okay. we could do that. We have like four benches out there. Yeah. yeah. Just G- kick everybody else out and just fucking run back and well, forth. Look at Jim Williams. You know who that is? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. He was a major proponent of a different type of mess pro- rest pause method. It was more like a a maximal singles method. So he'd take like say ninety nine percent of his max, do one single, rest like thirty seconds, do as many he can that way. So there's all sorts of ways. Right. I think a lot of it came down to conserving like time and equipment because mm-hmm. in prison you're sitting on your bench, you don't want somebody to jack it. So you gotta right. like, sit there and do it. <laughs> well there's a lot of ways to do things. Even if you follow the traditional five to five method mm-hmm. and let's say uh let's say week one it takes you a half an hour to get through your five sets of five of your working sets with 300 pounds or whatever. And the next week, you could just make it a goal to shave down two minutes off of that. Yeah. And so on. And you'll get stronger. Yeah, people talk shit you on CrossFit. You don't have to even add weight. You'll get stronger that way. People talk shit on CrossFit, but they talk about uh, different modalities to, to improve on and time being one of them, right? right. Like, Density. They'll, they'll say max yeah, yeah, yeah. deadlift. They'll say max deadlift. You got 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Like, fuck, dude. All right. or, or, you know, <laughs> and West Side and other people have done that for a long time where they're doing dynamic days. They're only getting 30 seconds of rest where right. people are like, oh, CrossFit's so dumb. We're like, they're doing some things that are right. <laughs> well, I mean, look at it this way. If you bench the bar today, you had five pounds a week for three years doing 825 raw. It's not real realistic. <laughs> so you have to find other yeah, yeah. modalities to increase intensity. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You're going to have to find diff- different ways to do different things. What are some other uh, routes that you took to, <coughs> to gain the knowledge to uh, – because you're you know, one of the f- first strength coaches uh, I heard about kind of in the powerlifting world or in general. Like what, what else uh, besides talking to Tukey did you uh, figure out to, well, to learn some Well, that's actually kind of later. So – <laughs> 
initially what I did is um, when I was training myself is um, I, I moved around the country to train with various people, like like train with like Gary Frank, people like that, and moved oh, all over man. the country. Matt Vincent talks about Gary Frank all the yeah. time. Yeah, I've never yeah. met him, but Matt Vincent uh, always talks about Gary Frank. Gary Frank, first man to ever do 2,400 pounds, 2,500 pounds, and 2,600 pounds. Yep. Yeah. So he I was just moved. way ahead of his time. He crushed everybody. I couldn't figure out my deadlift, so I had to move around, train with different people to get it up. And then what I did is I just harassed people, call them up, and... <laughs> Talk. They talked to me yeah. eventually if I kept calling. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you learn? What's some something you learned from uh, some of these guys? You know, like uh, let's say, you know, someone like uh, Gary Frank. What's something in particular that you may have picked up? I from? think the biggest thing I learned from him was um, I was having a pr- uh, what I used to do um, was when I deadlift I'd roll the bar, and then uh, somebody at the gym when I, I was like nineteen was telling me that's not a good idea. This guy was like you know like forty five and you know deadlifting like five fifty or, or right. something. And saying, "Oh, you can't do it that way. It's not proper form." And then Gary just looked at me. He's like, "He's like, they can't deadlift 900 bra." He's like, "You roll the bar, you'll be faster." I said, "Okay." <laughs> and so, like things like that is like yeah. kind of like he taught me a lot about speed, and then like kind of adapting the individual style to yeah. your needs because, like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to matter what you lift on the platform, not not how you got there. Yeah, that guy was a freak athlete. What about someone like Ed Cohn? Ed Cohn, um, I think what i learned most from him is he's very methodical yeah. like so be very methodical time. yeah it's Big hard time. that's hard that's hard to do and he's very intelligent about training around injuries yeah and he also uh turned me on into using um you know like kind of like a cross style of using sumo deadlifts to increase conventional and vice versa because right. he was a big proponent of that and i've used that with like you know like you know matt mills right yeah right okay 810 you. deadlift yep. the 242 so what we did with him is we don't even usually pull sumo to about six weeks out from a meet. Yeah, similar to Ed, yeah. Yeah, so similar to Ed. So yeah, learned a lot from Ed. Something I'm feeling lately is uh, the opposite, though. I always felt like conventional would help with sumo, but I haven't pulled conventional in a long-ass time. I just crushed a block PR conventional. Really? And I've only been pulling sumo. Well, I've used a lot of sumo, too, with conventional deadlifters because I did my first 500 conventional, first 600 sumo, first 700 sumo, first 800 conventional. I think it also depends on – the different styles that you use. If you're someone that's going to do your sumo deadlift with your feet out to the plates, yeah, and be yeah. extremely way upright, different. Maybe the transition from, uh, or the carryover rather from one to the other would probably be less because the, the two lifts are so different. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe the carryover for me, like I, I deadlift pretty wide when I'm conventional and then my transition over yeah. to sumos and I'm not lifting like a Russian, you know, with my sure. feet way out. And Mike is similar. Yeah. Your sumo stance is close. So, like, therefore, the, the tran- transfer of strength might be pretty good. Ed Cohn, 887. Yeah, uh, his are similar. Conventional and a 903 deadlift sounds crazy. And, today, so. and the thing no one talks about, he also did 850 when he was, like, 42 or 43 at the Mountaineer Cup in 2005. Yeah. And that's, I mean, he's <laughs> a master's lifter. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Russians, what's that guy doing? Is he going to pull 1,000 pounds of Belkin? fucking beltless at 220? I think he could uh, do that. Um, yeah, with straps, I think. You know, I think yeah. he just missed like a nine. It was nine sixty or nine seventy. You're your yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, what the fuck? I think Amazing. it was nine sixty or nine seventy. Yeah, because of grip. He doesn't look that big. I mean, he's got some hammies on him. And he stuff. looks insane, but, but he gets in such a perfect position. Yeah, he gets. He's just dialed in. Yeah, the positioning of it is is huge. He's pulling like nine hundred for reps. Yeah, that's, that's insane. No one does that. Yeah. <laughs> You, we're, before we got on the air, you were talking a little bit about uh, isometric training, and I think it's kind of an untapped area. Sure. You know, um, it's been around forever. I think people were using it in the fifties and sixties and stuff, but like it, it kind of comes and goes. It comes and goes out of favor. It's not, it's not like real sexy to do. It's not appetizing to do. It's, it's, it kind of hurts, and uh, you know, can, the positions can kind of be painful. Um, what are some of the be- benefits of isometric training, and what have you seen it do with some of the guys you work with? I've used isometrics with a lot of my top level lifters. People have set world records and stuff. Like it, it literally like morphed Jerry, Jeremy Hornstra. Yeah. So all sorts of people. It's that guy's kind of strong. <laughs> yeah, he's it's okay. Jesus Christ, six seventy five bench. Like, yeah. It seems like he does it every week. Well, what so what it does. If done correctly, it allows you to produce about 20% more force, 15% more force you could concentrically, um, you know, like on the way up, just right. in case someone doesn't know. And, <laughs> yeah, then, um, and it allows you to do it for about 15 times longer. So if you, for instance, like you do like a, like say your weakest sticking point in a bench press, you might only be in that area for a short time. This is going to allow you to be in that area for a longer time mm-hmm. and directly attack it by producing more force. So the way people do it wrong is they'll just hold the barbell in place with yeah. a heavy weight. So what that's doing is teaching you not to yield to an eccentric, okay? But when you get to that sticking point, you want to teach yourself 
to push through it, like prison rape that sticking point, excludes <laughs> right. the nomenclature. You know what I'm saying? Like you want to attack it like a mad dog. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, and that's what it's going to teach you to do. So you push in that spot for five to six seconds. And then the, it, what that does, is it's going to transfer about 15 degrees either way of where you're pushing it. Okay. And that's the complaint is only transfers to a certain joint angle, but that's where they're wrong is you're trying to hit a sticking point. It yeah. is a certain joint angle. Yeah, 15 degrees is, 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 is a good vari- a good variance, you know? Well, it's more than a sticking point. So, yeah, right. And then the way you can do that to actually make sure you transfer the dynamic lift after is do a lighter, like, submaximal weight. Say, like, with set, if you're doing on bench press, say you're stuck mid-range. Push as hard as you can for five or six seconds, wait a couple minutes, do, like, 75% for three reps as explosively as possible so you right. get that. That transference. Right. Are you doing that in all three lifts, or is it work Absolutely best in the bench? Could. The be- the work so far the best has been in bench and deadlift. Yeah, but it would work in squat too, but it hasn't been quite as effective. Positioning as in the squat just becomes a little weird. Yeah, uh, very like weird. Same yeah. same with even like an Anderson squat or something like that. Like I definitely think it has is a, a place and a time to as use squat, it, but it's hard maybe. to get under that and be in a similar position than you'd yeah. actually squat. Exactly. Right, and then yeah, you squat you, a squat like we used to squat out of the chains, and that would actually help quite a bit. That's yeah, kind of nice. That's a little bit better. I you think. can get set up underneath it, and you kind of you can swing them a little bit, which is kind of a little way to kind of cheat it. But then you're in a much safer position once you actually squat it. You could also probably uh, squat against a lot of chain weight, and if you had the chains kind of set up so where they just yeah, jacked bite you, you. And just nailed you in the right spot, maybe it would give well, you this you little get, similar. If you had two, uh, if you you could also pick it up and actually <coughs> go down, then have someone put the slide the. Catches right. in the rack bin, uh, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Push, we've been uh, we've been using the Compex machine, which is like a stem machine. Yeah, and once you, it goes like a thousand or something stupid. Yeah. And I turn it to like seventy, uh, and, and the strength levels nuts. Yeah, and, and it feels like it's gonna rip my quads off of my fucking bone. Uh, and they talk a lot about uh, it being basically like an isometric training. Well, that's another thing, like stem, like all these things are like it, they're not secrets. They've been out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Russians use them for forever. People, like for some reason. I guess because they don't get them Instagram likes or whatever, but yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't post you pushing against something and like not moving it. Or yeah, I got the stim <laughs> the stim unit on might be like kind of cute for one or two posts, but after a while, I get a little old. Yeah, right. but I use that a lot lately, especially just just my quads, just because it's uh, easiest to set up on my on my own. Um, and I've loved it. I think yeah. it's helped it's something a lot. Something bodybuilders should use too, because the recovery is like nothing. For it yeah. makes a difference yeah. in recovery. Yeah. Makes a difference in muscle size. Absolutely, I mean, it, it helps. It helps quite a bit. Um, so it makes sense what you're saying. Like in an isometric contraction, you're basically just able to to flex harder, able to yeah. kind of recruit more muscle muscle fibers. And if you think about it, is what's happening when you when you actually miss a lift is that there's some deceleration going on. You, you go to make the lift, and, you know, you might stop three-quarters of the way up, but that's not really your true sticking point. Your sticking point happened before that. You started to slow down. You started to produce less force. So if, for example, you had 500 pounds in the bar, and let's just hypothetically say you're pushing, you know, 550 pounds worth off your chest, as it goes up, you're pushing less and less and until you finally kind of stall out. Yeah. But what you're saying is with the isometrics, you could potentially be pushing 575, 600 yeah. pounds worth of force or something and like that. And for like five or six seconds, too. So right. it's not just like a millisecond. It's not, yeah, it's not just a half second. When are you uh, throwing this in like a training cycle? Say someone's uh, going to compete in like 12 weeks. <coughs> is is isometric something like eight to four? Well, it depends. So you could, if you knew exactly what needed to be attacked right from the get go, you could throw it in right away. They work well for about five to six weeks. So okay. it, you could That's put a it on pretty the, long time. Yeah, yeah, you could put it on the front and then they kind of like. Yeah, yeah. They don't really send you backwards. It's just kind of like it's one of those things that hits fast, improves fast, and kind of stalls out. Yeah. So you, I would say if you knew exactly what needed to be attack, you could do it right away. Okay, another time they're good to use is someone is like, so say you decide to take, you know, six months off from lifting, you come back and you bench 405. Right. Well, you're benching your 600 before, so – you could it will help you get back to that a lot quicker because you're producing that maximal force. So it's very good for people that have had like that are really strong that have had a long layoff to get them back faster. Does it take a little adjustment period to to get into them? Like you know, week one, you kind of maybe just you know you don't go all crazy on week one and you start to kind of accumulate not really way into it. You go kinda, for it, and you mostly use a empty barbell into pins. Is that the most yeah the, the majority of the way you're using mm-hmm. it? Yeah, you could I mean put weight on, but the thing is, so the. Obviously, the complaint would be if you just put an empty bar, but the reason if someone was here arguing with me, they'd say, well, no, you just need to hold it in place because last week you did 550, this week you did 560. You're getting better, but you're not, like you said, you're training yourself not to yield rather than push through. Yeah. Okay, so these are a waste of time. If you're not giving 100%, 
just don't do it. It's a waste of time because then all of a sudden, because we said it about 15% more than a concentric contraction. So okay. if you're going 85%, yeah, yeah. you might as well shoot the concentric. Right. So if you're not going full out, it's not really. How do you suggest doing them? Do you take them out of the rack and then push into something or is it just set up? You know, like, uh, is it set up in a real short? Is there any range of motion to it at all? Or is yeah, it there is. So you'd want to, um, if, unless you're going right off the bottom point, and, and even that, you could have two sets of pins. Two sets of pins. But you would want to, it's best to do a negative first because you can do more force on the concentric after. And so then kind of like punch into it? Yeah, so you, you don't, can't really like punch into it full speed or it's going to throw you off, but yeah. you know, you kind of hit it and then it's going to take a little bit to the full speed. But yeah, so if you, you're going to do an eccentric first, then you would want some bar weight. No, not necessarily. You can just oh. do like, you can just in the power rack with a bar. Just the bar, okay. Yeah. Four to five pounds. I mean, you could absolutely put bar weight on. I'm just saying yeah, you don't yeah. have to have bar weight on. <coughs> okay. This is a pretty advanced type deal, yeah. Someone that's been training one, two, three years may not they need, something, need like something like this. They probably need something like this. Yeah. Because I, I was even just at the seminar in, in Ohio a couple uh, it, it days ago. It also is just a it's, a it's a big setup to get into, and it's it's yeah. a, it's a little distracting, I think, more so for someone who's new. Like, just, just grab a hold of some dumbbells. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, and yeah. keep cranking through your workout. Well, I think with someone new... It could also throw off their motor pattern too. Yeah, yeah. They haven't even learned how to really like bench yet. Right. That's the big thing we talk about. You know, the conjugate and west side. Like, yeah, yeah, stuff like that can work. But if you don't know how to squat with just you know, yeah, regular, you, you don't need to throw all this shit at you. Absolutely. Well, you could be confusing yourself too if you're you know, like we talk about box squats all the time. We're fans of box squats, um, but you know, use them use them here and there. You don't have to use them all the time. And then also, if you're new, like just learn how to squat. You know, learn how to squat first. And and some coaches like to use the box to teach the squat or whatever. That's fine. But you don't, if you keep going back and forth between a regular squat and a box squat, yeah. you could potentially be kind of confusing And then yourself. you try to max out out of nowhere. And then we've had guys come up to us and say, oh, you know, I did 460 on a box squat. And then I tried a real squat and I bent, I squatted 360. What? And you're like, oh, shit. Like, you're, you know, you need to just, just focus on a regular squat. Right, so I noticed this recently, Ed Conan and I did a seminar in Austin. There's a couple people. <laughs> that we'd only been doing box squats that came in there and like right. it was amazing how much of a they're making it sound like oh yeah if i didn't box squat i'd do 150 pounds more it's like no you did 150 pounds less <laughs> right? right because you don't want to squat and like i've always noticed yeah. when i myself when i was doing box squats that actually helped my deadlift a lot more and i think yeah. some studies have confirmed that yeah. showing that yeah. you know you get that pause yeah, it's yeah. more get, posterior good, yeah exactly yeah. more well, posterior also more too, starting it could strength. be uh more beneficial to athletes you, you don't yeah, want yeah. them to hurt their sure. knees uh, yeah. Or even just a power lifter who starts to get banged up yeah. over a period of time, or somebody who wants to maybe start to implement oh, Lee squatting. Broke his back doing them. <laughs> Did he? That's what Fred Hatfield told yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. I mean, wow. you can get hurt doing anything. It's definitely possible. But you know, if somebody's going to start to incorporate squats three times a week or something, maybe that one time a week they're doing a box. Yeah, squat. just have a very yeah, box squat or belt squat. Yeah. I mean, that's when you do the higher frequency training. That's called specific variety where you do like a similar variation of lift because you, you're going to recover better that way. But right. if you're only squatting once a week and you're that's only box squatting, it ain't powerlifting at that point. Yeah. It's, it's fine. But Yeah, it's, the box won't be there when meet day comes. No. <laughs> right. We, we've had plenty of lifters here who couldn't reproduce their movement pattern yeah. on a box. And the, where do they always miss it at? The bottom, right? It yeah. feels weird in that transition. Yeah. 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 Where uh, a normal raw squatter that doesn't use a box, you'll miss out, just outside yeah. the hole. Often, yeah. rather and I than do in think the, the hole. box mm -hmm. had uh, definitely had more application when we were all in powerlifting gear. 100%. It definitely felt yeah. a lot yeah. better. The, it, and if you think about it, the the way the powerlifting gear is kind of set up, it sort of stops you anyway. And then one of the major problems with powerlifting gear is it can set you into a really bad position. It could kind of shoot your hips forward. Well, now if you sit back on the box, you're you're sitting in the perfect position. You're like literally sitting into like your suit. But now that people aren't using gear anymore there's really no reason to focus in on those as much yeah it's really hard with the raw squat to uh not some yeah. people can do it but to, to have a totally vertical shin yeah but in gear oh, yeah. almost everyone had a vertical shin That's right. besides some single ply guys well it's genius if you think of like you know louis simmons did for what the confines of how they're competing right. was of like we're wearing this kind of gear it's a monolith blah 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 genius but that if you're not competing that way it's not genius for you yeah right but the Bulgar bulgarian or conjugate uh, mixture can work still, right? Oh, if yeah. you throw in like front squats and some other stuff, sure. just, uh, it's got to be a little different. What what uh you're you're into a lot of different variations, yeah? Maybe give us like top three variations for a bench press that you like. Um, I really like um what we talked about earlier, the dead bench press. Okay, so that's just you know it's gonna yeah. be the the how far off your chest you're gonna start it from. If you have longer arms. You I call them nipple blasters. Yeah, when you had well, me longer arms, it better be further off your chest. Because I remember Mike, not. we were doing his shit a long time ago. He was killing Yeah, yeah it was probably about three or four yeah. years ago. Yeah. I was I was uh, yeah. just following along, Mark, and it didn't work so well because I was picking my own weights, and I was still uh, no clue what little, I was doing. a little heavy. Yeah, but it felt good. You got me to a 556 bench fast. Yeah. Yeah, real fast, yeah. 
And it was um, – the thing is, <coughs> so when you're doing those, you want to make sure if you got longer arms, you start a little further off your chest because the longer arm, taller person only has one advantage on the bench press, the longer eccentric. So it's going to push it off the chest a little more than someone shorter arm, barrel chested. Okay, so – and then the other one would be the Spoto press. Yeah, great. Which, it's a great one. And it's sort of funny when you watched uh, Eric set the world record, everybody was kind of – making fun of him, like, he doesn't touch his chest. You know, yeah. he's going to do 500 when he gets to a meet. Well, he didn't do 500 when he got to the meet. He <laughs> right. broke yeah, yeah. the world record. It's a different if you're uh, – because a 24-hour gym bro who's not touching his chest because he can't rather than Spoto who's not touching his chest by choice. And he's you know, also, it's like a little yeah, bit different. Yeah, he's he's reversing that weight by himself. Yeah, like, his back's exactly. tight. Yeah. I kind of refer to it as like a momentumless bench. Although, you know, sometimes he would chuck him and do those little kind of half reps things that he liked to do. But he's really keeping attention on. That's what people 100%. are kind of kind of missing. And you watch uh, Krill Serkev, who broke his world record, yeah. broke Eric's world record. He's literally benching the same exact way. It's just slightly different. He does make contact with his chest. But that weight is zeroed out too. Like he's not letting that's that Al Davis sink at all. too. Yeah. You know Al Davis? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of people. Seventy five bench. Then the other one I like is, um, and I swear they didn't like corner me ahead. Al of time. Davis is, is that guy is huge. Slingshot. Is Al Davis uh, fifty? Uh, not. Uh, he's like mid forties. <laughs> mid forties. <laughs> he's getting. But but he be, but it didn't close he bench, enough. <laughs> but but he's in his mid forties. But didn't he bench over six hundred pounds at like forty something years old? Yeah, he benched. Um, he benched six twenty eight at forty something years old, yeah. and then, and it's like when he's younger. Before he took the time off, he did six seventy. Yeah, that's Just... fucking nuts. Yeah, Crazy. so he, I mean, when he did the the six twenty eight too, it, it was a pretty short comeback. So he's taking some more time off again. He got hurt or something. and came back right. Remember yeah, that? and he said I was literally following his stuff for a long time. He, he's fucking enormous, that guy. Yeah, he he's legit. <coughs> All right, third thing you like? What do you say? Slingshot. What'd you say? What'd you say? All right, there that wasn't cornered enough. There's no. <laughs> yeah. A little, little money under the table. <laughs> the, what do you like the, about the Pokemon the... Bowl or whatever it's called? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you like about the slingshot? The overload. There you go. And there's no learning curve. So yeah, yeah. Here's what. I, okay, like you know the th- people that are interested in the theory. So if raw bench press was trained with the shirt, you know it'd be like the greatest thing ever for overloading. Okay, it sounds good in theory, but I'm not going to waste Al Davis or Jeremy Hornster's time trying to learn how to use a bench shirt for eight weeks because we're actually trying to train to get stronger, not learn how to use a bench shirt. With right. a slingshot, we can put it on five seconds and learn how to actually do it. Right. So there's no learning curve because we don't yeah. have time for that crap. Well, there's like a three-year period where I was in power thing year where I literally didn't get any stronger. But I went from like a 2,300-pound total to 26. So it's just learning the gear, getting used to how heavy those fucking yeah. weights are and, and really just uh, learning at some point to stop being so scared of <laughs> seeing all those fucking plates Well, it's bar. weird when you – because I've trained some of gear and lifting gear before too – it's different because, like, when, you know, you're training more raw, as soon as you pick up the weight or whatever, it'll feel kind of heavy. With gear, you pick it up. I mean, when you've been training in gear, you go raw. I remember one time before I'd done my 600, I'd done over 600 in a shirt, and I remember putting 555, and I thought, by the way, my shirt had been, my raw would keep up. And yeah. I took out the weight on my hand, and I was like, I'm going to do 10 reps of this. Got it down to the bottom, didn't move. Yeah, buckled, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, the buck stopped somewhere, and that's kind of – a big thing right there talking about the slingshot, too, is we can kind of take that away from gear lifting. The upside was, okay, I realized that my triceps could lock out heavier weights. So what did I take away from the gear lifting? Well, the board presses sometimes aren't bad, That this and that, and some of the tricep work, right. that, you know, but we got to do the whole thing. Right. Um, what are uh, some of the favorite, like, uh, well, I guess with the isometrics, just going back to that for a second, did you um, – do you like to do those fresh, or do you like to do those as assistants, or could they be utilized in both spots, um, or, or I, either, either one? I usually like use them after the heavy, like so. At least do like a lot of times. What I'll do is like the heaviest set of the day, right? And then when I'll, we'll do some compensatory acceleration work after speed work. Yeah. Speed work, but I don't like to use that term only because for one, I was mentored by Fred Hatfield, so got to pay yeah, yeah. my homage. <laughs> for two, usually speed work means really light. Yeah, yeah. we're right. talking heavier. Like in the training zone, so seventy like to eighty, anywhere from like the lowest fifty-five, the highest like eighty-five. So, yeah, so again, to you know, uh, back to West Side Barbell stuff and Louis Simmons mm-hmm. and, and dynamic effort method. Um, the dynamic effort method, the guys are like moving the weights around, especially when it came to bench press mm-hmm. with bands or chains. A lot of times, sometimes straight weight, but they're moving around. Even guys that bench six, seven, eight hundred pounds, sometimes they're only using one hundred eighty-five pounds, and they're moving these weights around hundred miles an hour. What you're talking about is much different. It's more of a mindset of trying to move the weights fast. Um, and although you're trying to deliver some real speed, you did just get done with some heavy sets. Yeah. 
and you also are using a weight that is only going to move so fast. And Fred Hatfield is typically straight weight, yeah? <coughs> yes. So, so it's basically you're moving from point A to point B as explosively as possible without sacrificing technique or tightness. Yeah. Right. And then also without uh, diminishing speed from one set to the next. Yes. Then you would just cancel yeah. out that and move on to the next thing. Yeah. I'm talking to Ed Cohn and, and someone I've worked with a lot of Jeremy Hamilton. Yeah. Like a lot of their training is just that. You know, Ed's doing two or three weeks of, of tens, but all those tens, he's kind of crushing them. You yeah, know, they're like you're fast. getting tired, but you're crushing. They're yeah. they're heavy tens yeah. in the beginning of a cycle, but you're crushing them. Absolutely, they're, you're doing them perfect and fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know someone like someone like Cone. You know, Cone was kind of like a, a one or two set guy, but a lot of that's just because he had so much experience and so much fucking strength that and yeah, there's a lot of weight. The volume, you know, the the amount of volume that that started to happen was astronomical, just because he's well, eight fifty for like two <laughs> sets of five with just knee wraps on. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's I heavy. Mean, <laughs> Yeah, his you know, much yeah he would do he would too. do uh, you know seven plates for a set of five and seven plates and a quarter for a set of five and so on until he got to his main well, thing. That's very uh, Shako ish. But uh, yeah, if you start talking, I mean, I've never talked to or, or really heard a lot of Milanichev or, or, or Kirill and how they train. But by observing their top sets, you know, I think Kirill did six seventy five for three or five reps before he benched seven fifty or seven forty, yeah. and it looked very similar. Yeah. Right, he's kind of crushing them. Absolutely. And then when he benched 740, you're like, fuck, dude, that guy could bench 800. Maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. But either way, he's so efficient. Right. Looks beautiful when he does it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's unbelievable uh, with, with, uh, with his fucking technique, with such heavy weight. Yeah, you know? and being so big. So like, he's got long did, arms. You also did uh, bodybuilding. Yeah. You did bodybuilding for a long time. I didn't actually compete, though. I just trained with – I wanted to learn bodybuilding, so I trained with um, – Brian Dobson, the owner of Metroflex Gym. Yeah. Guy just got Ronnie Coleman and all those guys yeah. going. So, you did bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman. Yeah. Did you get your pro card in strongman? Right? Or- no, I did not. If I got well <coughs> by the NAS or whatever. No, um, I was very close. And then um, I d- I won the Atlanta Strongest Man in America, hmm. which I think was a tougher contest because it was. Um, or I guess it was, I should say it's more real strength. It was right. overhead press, bench press, trap bar deadlift. Pull up for weight and a grip test all in oh, one shit. day. Took, and we wouldn't have that many people enter it, so <laughs> because it was only like the cream of the crop that got invited, you know, right? Like four hours or something to do all the events. Oh, wow. Was this a little while ago? Because now you, you, you 2005. see 2005. Yeah, because you see man now and they're all six, six, seven and above. But back in the day, you know, there's Poundstone and some other guys that yeah. were around more of the six foot height. Well, I think right now they're at their, their best ever because like you used to look at people. They'd be like, okay, this guy is really fast, has really good endurance, but like if he gets heavy lifting, he ain't gonna do anything. Yeah, or yeah, this yeah. guy is gonna have a heart attack if it's over one rep. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, so they had to pick and choose their contest. Yeah. Now the best guys will show up anywhere yeah. and can dominate on about anything. So like you look at someone like Brian Shaw size, he's amazing. He's not slow. Yeah. You know, yeah. no, no, he's quick. He's quick. And he can do some reps. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's like like ten years yeah. ago, he would just people like that would show up and like deadlift one rep and pray there was no. Yeah, and then we got uh, Hap Thor, who's yeah. a great athlete too. Yeah, He's yeah. moving around a thousand yeah. miles an hour with guys those eggs and stuff. Guys are in a lot better shape now. Yeah. But then yeah. you had like remember like Marius Pujanowski was in great <coughs> shape, but he couldn't have hung with the yeah yeah the big world big. record deadlifts and stuff. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. pretty cool. Even that sport now it's been around a good while. You mm-hmm. know, it's still evolving. Everything's kind of always evolving. Training, I think, is getting yeah. smarter. The athletes, uh, you know, some of them, or the majority of them now, get to kind of be pro athletes. You know, who knows yeah. what they actually get paid, but they're trying to uh, really focus in and be real real athletes. What are a few things you learned the last uh, maybe two years or so uh, that have cha- changed things for the way that you train people and the way you train yourself? Um, one of the major ones, I think a breakthrough is um, actually more for, because I train a lot of high-level bodybuilders too, is more for hypertrophy training is applying cluster sets to to hypertrophy training so that's like a little poliquin esque yeah so more sets less reps so like let's say for your triceps you're gonna do like a tricep rope push down for an easy exercise okay take a weight you can do like 15 reps with do five to six rest 15 seconds repeat that sequence for like five to six minutes yeah. so you can use heavier weight yeah and you, you start to do the weight. math and you'll end up with more volume at Hell the end of, of a it lot more volume yeah that's that's been a huge one and then uh, I think another one is the isometrics. Uh, so that's a little. Re- that's like rest pause almost too, right? Anna? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's yeah. exactly what it is. The form. I mean, in lab in like the lab setting, when they test it. They'd go ape shit if you called it, you know, rest pause. Yeah. Cluster yeah. set, but it's pretty much <laughs> <laughs> cluster <laughs> sets too. Can have uh, they're more open in our rest pause is more open into like I'm gonna go as many as I can stop. Right. Make it where this is gotcha. more like a five, five, five. Gotcha. Okay. And you'll end up with 25. You'll do five sets of five instead yeah. of doing one set of 15 to failure. Cluster sets can also be done where 
you're taking like a rep of you know like one to three Mm -hmm. and then you're doing a rep of like five to six correct because i've done them that way before absolutely like a staggered set so you do one set you know you do one set of uh, let's just say you bench 405 for for one and then your next set is uh, 315 for six. Then your next set is 410 for one. And then your next set after that is 335 for six. Because wave loading. That, yeah, you're getting that wave That's loading. Like, you're getting that neurological response because your nervous system's getting so fucking I have a fired co- up. Coming out with a new book in January, um, uh, and it's one of the major programs is there, is for wave loading for yeah. all three lifts. And that's one of those ones. It feels that, really good. It, to do well, that. it's this method's a do or die. So it's either going to take <laughs> you to the next level, or you're going to, or you're going to, you know, a lot of a lot of people we tested on didn't do well with it. They burned out. <laughs> take a but a lot day. of people made like gains you wouldn't believe too. So it's one of those ones you're kind of yeah. rolling the dice to see what happens. <laughs> if you can make it to the other side, then you're going to be a better man. <laughs> you're going to be a better man. So. We talked a lot about that about all your programs. <laughs> like I'm, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this bench session because it's more than I do in a month. But if I do, I'm going to be all right. Well, another thing I think is, in, you know, important is like what I, I, I try to do is and learn, keep and I've reinforced this is I don't have one way of doing things. That's why I haven't come out with like a particular like one method. And like because I feel like if you come out with one particular method at that point, you kind of operate from ego dominance in the sense of yeah. you have to make it fit this. Yeah. Box. yeah. Or I don't care if you're going to squat four times a week. You're going to do one time a week. As long as the end of the day, it's getting better. Yeah. Who the hell cares? All I care about is people's results. When I think, right. uh, you know, going back to the other question yeah. of how you kind of gained your knowledge, that's that's what happens. And that's, <coughs> you know, I think where me and Mark and Jim are, are benefited too because we bring in all different kinds of guests. Right. Yeah. And some of them are a little streamlined in their thought, but we get to talk to <laughs> the top 10 best, yeah, right? Sure. And so we get gather information from the top 10, and then maybe we add a little bit of their stuff into our training or people were coaching and then like shit yeah there is a lot of ways to get strong I, there are a lot need, of ways to get strong i need to mark that down for silent mike that was uh, brilliant streamlined <laughs> in their thought thank you very much that yeah. was good yeah. but yeah it's a, it's a good point it's it's that uh when all you have is a hammer argument everything looks like a nail and everybody yeah they will always try to f- fit their thing into <coughs> your thing and, uh, their thing you know what i'm saying <laughs> anyway going it's like the old thing: the map's not the territory. The way you see your map's not necessarily the whole territory. So you got to look at everything. Yeah. Um, and so right now you uh, you do some personal training. You do a lot of online, online training. training. Yeah. And uh, what are some things you've learned about business in the last few years to uh, you know help increase and help uh, more people be aware of Jailhouse Strong and stuff like that? I think the main thing is. Um, is customer service making it about like the people's actual results rather than like. You know, you'll see somebody post on Twitter, like, my client did this. Like, yeah, they're basically, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. they're trying to take credit for everything I know, I they've done. I always thought that was weird. My athlete. My yeah, my athlete. That's I'm I like, too. Yeah. Or we. If I'm posting. Even, even people talk about, with like, uh, the Cubs. Like, we we, we did it. Yeah. Like, yeah. well, you didn't do shit. The Cubs. I would just say this. If I'm series. posting a video of somebody, I'm training them. Here's unless a guy I'm noting, I work with. <laughs> I'm, uh, much yeah. different than saying my. Well, I just post the video. And I, I guess <laughs> I would assume if I'm posting and I'm working with them, unless I note otherwise. Not like, my client did this and I'm a genius. No. I'm trying to help this person at the next level. So it's about serving people, not yeah. about like gratifying yourself. Because yeah. like, you know, if like your slingshot, if you if you make it about other people's results, all the other business part, the money and all that stuff will, will follow. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and also too, like, you know, what's more impressive? Some, somebody going from a 225 bench to a 315 bench or somebody going from a 500-pound bench to a 510 bench. Yeah. And not it's everybody still more under- impressive to yeah. make that larger gain, you know? Yeah. Not everybody always sees that, but it is. Right. It is. So I think that's the biggest thing is is that. And then actually, like, communicating with people. So it's funny how people, like, are amazed that I actually respond to them. It's like, I mean, <laughs> you're a person. Of course I'm going to respond to you, yeah. you know? I mean. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, just part of the fitness industry in general, you know, because we get similar things. If I answer an email from just some random kid, he's like, oh, I'm so surprised you answered. Yeah. Because a lot of, like, fitness figures out there don't. You know, yeah, they're it's above crazy. It. But, why? yeah, why would you start this? Well, to help people. That's You'd why I'm going to try to a- answer your email. Some of that is dependent on how people come at you, too. Uh, 100%. Yeah, I've had some people come at me pretty weird. And I yeah. still respond, but I'll, I'll try to get at them a little tougher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like w- one guy was wanting to <coughs> email me, wanting, said he'd pay me 2000 bucks to beat him up or something. <laughs> some freak. That's the one I, so did, I did not respond to. I was going to say, what did you spend it on? So that's the majority <laughs> yeah. of your uh, income? Well, I mean, five grand, we were we start talking. <laughs> did he also ask Two for grand, your panties? No. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking some weirdos out there. Yeah, you know, Silent Mike hits up a lot of people with those kinds of questions. So yeah, I was hoping if as long as you'd be like a two by four, and I have to actually touch them, we could really negotiate. No, no, the price I want down. skin on skin contact. <laughs> That's five. Then. He probably wants uh, like a naked head scissors or something. Yeah. <laughs> 
Would you say oral transfer? I want that. Mm. Oral yeah. tradition. Tradition. I, I want some it. oral tradition in our two grand uh, party. Holy crap. We can't talk about that. <laughs> 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 um, what is it going on with uh, gas station ready? What is that? What is that about? Okay, gas station ready is a hashtag that we came up with, and it's basically um, – uh, my partner Don Bichia, and and he was talking, teaching a, some sort of st- seminar, and he was talking about like um, if somebody attacked you at the gas station at three a.m. So right. then I, I posted something, put gas station ready after that, <laughs> and it was just basically um, how it was in Jailhouse Strong. There's a self. See, he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, but he's also a self-defense trainer. We've interviewed That's a lot of joke. people. Yeah. So what we did is um, basically the self-defense is aimed at like how to actually defend yourself as quickly as possible. In the words of George Christie. Take care of business and don't let, don't stand around to admire your work. Get out of there. That's mm. what gas station ready is like. Just and then for training purposes, it's just training to be ready for anything. Right. And it's going to happen quickly. So, right. And then the hashtag just kind of took off because a lot of people aren't training. Well, there's a for, lot of weird shit going on nowadays. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. People fucking shooting up schools. It just and, happened at Ohio State. Yeah. I don't know if you're. It's heard like about a machete that. or something. Yeah. A guy drove into like literally drove yeah, into a classroom. And I, I was with a bunch of the students all week. I was there, and uh, they That's said, crazy. like, he wasn't yelling or anything, which is even weirder. He was, like, kind of quiet, and he just started trying to hack people yeah. with a butcher knife. knife right? So weird. Yeah, you got to be ready for something. Come at fucking gas, gas station, station ready. ready with a knife. And stay you're ready. So it basically means stay ready so you don't have to get ready is what gas yeah, station yeah. ready means. And uh, feel free to use a hashtag. We got we just came out with some shirts. They're selling That's well. That's Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, like, uh, the other day a friend of mine uh, posted up, you know, something about, like, you know, learning how to shoot a gun. And uh, they just said, you know, whatever you think about guns is is your own decision. I don't want to hear it. They said, I, I choose to like I choose to learn how to use a gun. Yeah, yeah. Rather I thought be that safe was cool. Than sorry, yeah. Yeah, like I don't want to fear anything. And That's I thought cool. that was cool. Like, you can't for, carry guns out here, though, can you? <laughs> it's a little different. Yeah, you're walking around with some twenty inch guns yeah. right now, buddy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you can. It's a little more complicated to get a yeah. Is it concealed carry? carry I heard it's really hard, and we don't really have open carry. Yeah, here, but. But you can kill somebody if you feel like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, the, the if, you got a good storage spot. Here. If all the people who stocked up on on weapons <coughs> and and ammunition, you know, recently, uh, had been in the gym trying to get strong so that they could handle any situation that might actually happen. Yeah, yeah. you know. Anyway, we had uh, well, a lot of it's just like you said, getting strong is like okay. I agree that if you can bench press a lot, that doesn't mean anything on the street necessarily, but. I think you're less likely to get mugged if you're like a more intimidating target. Yeah, so appearance, yeah. everything's a little bit. Yeah, easy. also being strong and being confident. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mentally, know. maybe you'll talk yourself out of it rather than just punch somebody or maybe whatever. Maybe if it is. a, a lot of predator factors. or whatever sees you, you know, walking around and you and you you're walking around with some confidence, maybe they're not like, gonna. Yeah, I don't want to mess with gonna, that. Yeah, maybe they're gonna find someone that's easier to pick on. They're not looking for a challenge usually. They're looking to like for prey to make. S- Rob yeah. somebody, make some money, and yeah. you're not only protecting yourself; you're kind of protecting whoever's around you too, because they they figure that if something if something happens and it's within your eyesight, you're going to intervene. You know, yeah. you're not going to just walk away. So, and this stuff happens at the gas station more than anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy how we that had is. Uh, uh, Tony. Uh, yeah, Senate Seminant. Yeah, yeah. Seminant. Uh, real world tactical. Senate. You ever see that guy? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What a yeah. goddamn beast that guy is. That guy's gas station ready. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he he goes down to Texas and trains. I don't know which. He trains a branch sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the metros. He goes to Destination Dallas, too. I haven't met him yet. but he yeah, Tony's really cool. Yeah, you like him. Yeah, he's, he's been really going cool. crazy lately. He jumps like, <laughs> inside the tire, then fucking outside the tire, then turns around and grabs the tire and fucking throws it over his head. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's not. He's been going crazy. Where does he actually live? He uh, lives Florida. in Florida. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he's been going. He he's travels a good amount, I think. He's been going crazy. You were mentioning earlier uh, with the bench press about you know, um, there's somewhat of an advantage of having longer arms. You kind of said uh, you kind of can get more out of the eccentric. Have you noticed a difference? Like Al Davis is what six five? Yeah. Um, I mean, Jeremy Hornsch is not tall, but he's he's what five ten? Yeah. Five you nine. know, um, then Julius, the other guy that I trained that um, did the six seventy seven. He's like six foot five. Yeah, I always talk about Mark not necessarily being built for the bench. Like Mark's built big arms and big pecs, but his arms are kind of long. Yeah. So. Yeah, so there's some advantage. I mean, you know, you got a lot of guys that make excuses for like, oh, I'm not built for this, built for that. And then you said for yourself that you're not built to deadlift. Well, you said, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to figure well, that's it out. What, 
do you think if you're walking around like you know and you're claiming to be some you sort can't of can't make that excuse to the judges and say hey can you give me credit for an 800 pound deadlift or a handicap even though i only did 750 no but you'll see like some like <laughs> i deadlifted 770 but bench you know 314 and i'm a strength training genius guru like yeah well why in the hell don't you increase your bench then with this you know genius yeah, i talk that about are. that a lot too yeah. like uh same thing i bench 405 <laughs> in the gym but whatever like but like i always sucked at benching like for, yeah, so, so for me to bench 405 yeah it was fucking awesome yeah exactly yeah. Uh, what are some things that you did to help uh, build up that deadlift? As you said, it was a struggle. Um, one of the main things was I, I told you that. So Gary Frank worked for me on the technique of rolling the bar because I was pretty explosive. Teaching it to be more explosive. It was fashion. very explosive with that. I started doing um, more speed work at submaximal weights because um, that's the big thing I picked up from him. What worked great from him, what didn't work as well with it, he did is he trained like only heavy singles pretty much. Mm hmm. So I got more out of doing the – because I think I think partly what it was also is technical reinforcement by – all of a sudden after your heaviest deadlift, you're doing six or eight sets of triples with submaximal weight. You're just building that motor padding, building that yeah. motor padding. I never really liked singles in the deadlift that much. I, I, I mean, obviously there's time and place for all types of training. But I kind of also think that if you're going to go through the whole process of setting everything up and putting your belt on, getting chalk and the whole song and dance every single time, and you can obviously – do more than one rep why not do a couple of reps and get more out of it like to me five sets of two is a more effective workout a lot of times than five sets of well, one and a lot of fatter can, people need it to get down for the second <laughs> yeah, yeah they need yeah they yeah. need the, the weight of the bar to kind of yeah kind seriously of push themselves down um what do you think the advantage is for you with rolling the bar into yourself so you're talking about setting up kind of far away from the bar and then and then rolling the bar yeah towards so you. it looks like it's just like a free-for-all kind of just roll it in and jerk it that's not the case so what you're going to do is actually kind of do a couple mini rolls and like progressively tighten. So you're not going from zero to 100, say it's zero to 20, zero to 40, zero to 60. Then you're tightening as you roll. Then at 100, you're pulling up. So it's still not a jerk. Can it's we just look it up on YouTube? You can look it up on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, maybe. It, it creates a pseudo. It's Brian Shaw and some other guys do something <coughs> yeah. similar. Well, it creates an it, What it does is deadlift is called a deadlift because it's a concentric only. Right. So if you roll the bar and drop your ass, it creates like a pseudo eccentric, which is going right. to assist you to lift a little more right. weight. And if you're fighting for tooth and nail for every pound you can get. I try to get a little stretch reflex. So you're, stretch, stretch you're uh, in some ways, too, utilizing the barbell to help you get in better position as well. Yeah. Uh, almost impossible to do a sumo? Uh, sumo, yeah. I, I, a little too tough? It, it doesn't. Um, well, so, the, the, so one of the problems with uh, – or one of the advantages of a sumo deadlift is to – you're it's taking – different uh, – uh, Yeah, tell me where to go. Just put uh, Josh Bryant um, deadlift training. Oh, okay. So you're taking your um, – when you do a sumo deadlift, you're taking your stomach out of the yeah. way of the lift because now your legs are out wider, whereas conventional, uh, your thighs and your stomach, are kind of, everything's all sort of jammed together. Yes. And so when you, when you have the bar far out from you, for those of you that have a hard time putting your shoes on, it makes it easier to grab the bar. It's very easy to grab the bar, even if your range of motion is limited, and then you can roll the weight towards you. Yeah, that's super fast. Yeah, so see what I was doing there is just really trying to accelerate each one. I'm watching video, Josh kind of rolling the weights into him, and he doesn't have the weight really far away from himself. It's just uh, maybe about a foot away from him, and then he rolls it right into his shins. When it makes contact with his shins, he then is uh, getting his back really tight and, and pulling the weight into himself. <clears throat> what are some other exercises that you like for deadlift that has really helped a lot? Um, with deadlifting, one thing that for me was huge was um, doing the isometrics at the top of the movement because um, when you deadlift and roll the bar, you're basically you know you're gonna pick your poison in the sense of if you're you're gonna if you do it that way, it's gonna come fast off the floor, but then it's gonna be tougher at the top because you're not getting set in that perfect position a lot of times where you could set more and it's gonna be slower off the floor and easier at the top. So for me, I'd get stuck at the top sometimes because of the way I rolled it. Yeah, the isometrics just kind of circumvented that. Yeah, you aren't rolling it very far. I see a lot of people who are rolling a, a big way. Um, yeah, and I think the argument against rolling is uh, consistency. <coughs> yeah, right? it is. If, you're, if you're rolling it, you know, six feet and you hit a little pebble, mm -hmm. that's going to fuck up your... <laughs> well, less range of motion, less room for error. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it makes sense with the argument against it, but... It, um, it kind of seems like it helps you f be in the right position, though. Like when you you hit that certain spot, and then your your positioning is similar every time. It does because it it, it was like um, when you have shorter arms too, and you're big. It's it's gonna be harder to get down than if your yeah. arms hang down yeah. six more inches. 
Yeah. A most interesting part about this video is that your form still sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is older, but you're so. brutally strong. No, you're just over the bar a little bit, which is actually pretty common for a lot of people because a lot of people like to use their lower back when they deadlift. Each person has kind of their own their own form and technique. It's always strong from all – that's especially if I've been doing strongman training and stuff too. So Right. Um, so the isometric training that you did with the deadlifts, you, again, just kind of take a bar and set it up just a few inches shy of lockout and uh -huh. just push into the – Pull as hard as I can. That one I'd actually put um, – a little bit of weight on the bar? Yeah, like he's like 500 pounds or something just to make sure I'm in the actual right spot, not just, you know, like a barbell. So Gotcha. And then would you There's unrack eight. that and then kind of walk it back out of the rack and then you know, no, just push drop, into something? Just drop it after I'm done. Oh, oh, you start from the floor. Yeah. You'd start from the floor and then pull in. Okay, gotcha. Do you do any reps that way or is it just a single? Single, then do I do a, sing, a, a single sets. after. You would do a full range of motion single afterwards? Yeah. Exactly. Push into the pins for one rep. Then Bring, do one back and forth. So usually like one. three points in the spot. Ah, I got you. So I did a lot of volume too to build up. Yeah, so right there, I mean, and that that was one workout. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. It's <laughs> yeah, a lot. I did a lot of volume to work out. So you're one time a week. Off the mark. You're one time a week though. With the deadlift. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, a lot of volume one time a week with the deadlift. And um, actually the person – I learned that from when I was traveling around was a guy named George Brink. He's in California. Do you know who that is? I've heard the name before. He was the first person over 50 to deadlift 800. And he mm. knew, like, even at 50 years old, his workout would basically be for seven weeks. He'd go five sets of 10, oh. stiff-legged deadlifts off a block uh, with no I belt. I think he might have taught He might have taught Dan Green how to lift. He could have. I think he might have. Is he, he's, he's in this area, you said? Well, he was in Ventura back then, but now he, he died a little like a year ago, but he wasn't uh, like Shasta. Dan Green a long time ago for Power Magazine wrote an article about a deadlift party, and he said, I think he said he learned it from that guy, basically just deadlifting all fucking day long. <laughs> yeah, and they do. there's never any deloads or anything, so <laughs> I kind of had to refine that for yeah, everybody. Yeah, for normal people. For normal people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about frequency on the other lifts? Uh, you mentioned deadlift uh, about once a week's normal for you pushing up. What about so, squat and dead, uh, bench? Okay, for when I was at my strongest, personally, I'll, I'll do whatever somebody needs. So um, it could be it's going to vary with yeah. with clients. But for me, at my best, I'd squat twice a week, once heavy, and then once as like a warm up to deadlifts. Mm -hmm. And then um, I've tried like all the higher frequency programs, and, and like no matter how I, you know. Skinned it. It's it didn't hard work. to make progress. Yeah, and then um, for bench, I would go um, a heavy bench day, then a accessory day of shoulder and tricep work, where I might do some close grips and things like that. Is it's, that what you feel uh, is optimal? Uh, not only for you, but for most people. I know it is. I think that's a good so starting times. point. Gotcha. And that then, would be a good starting point for a lot of people. And so, say like you know, a majority of the population is going to seventy percent of the population to fall within that range and do yeah. well. Then we have people on either side because. Yeah. Like Julius, the guy I was telling you about earlier, to the 677 bench that I trained, we got him down to, you know, he's benching heavy three times a month, and he's making the best progress he's right, made yeah, so yeah. far. Any difference with females? They can handle um, they can handle a lot of volume, and a lot of them, a lot, I've noticed more of them do better on higher frequency yeah, yeah. programs, which is contrary to what you read in a textbook. They make it sound like they take less time to recover, and I just don't think that's true because – Oh, they're they're not as strong for one right. a lot of times and and they just seem to do a little bit better with yeah you got to imagine they're not recruiting as many like motor units yeah. and their muscle fibers aren't yeah. firing the same so maybe their nervous system isn't getting taxed as much yeah, as often so i don't know if this is true either we have a thing here where all my shit's very uh <laughs> jumbled but um i bet if you took the top like chick deadlift and the top guy deadlift and compare the the differences it's way greater than it is the top chick uh marathon and the guy top guy marathon yeah of course you know they're all endurance based right. muscularly yeah right yeah and the, the, the also with uh you know with with a heavy heavy like uh deadlift for some of these bigger guys even though they are huge guys like we're looking at eddie hall right here you know first guy yeah. to do 1100 pound deadlift an 1100 pound de deadlift is not relative to anything like it's not that's not real like just because it's 1100 pounds for him and it, and it's like his max mm -hmm. that's not related in any way to somebody else's 315 max it's not and they've yeah. proven and that I scientifically that, i think that people think that and they're 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 not associated with well, each other at all they're, they actually did a study on that a couple like a fucking different years ago showing you need longer rest periods the stronger you get that's not right. debatable like if you squat 600 for 10 reps it's not you don't you know it's not the same as someone squatting 300 for 10 reps relatively if they're 
twice as strong. You need a hell of a lot longer rest period if you're doing 600 for 10. Right. Yeah, the weights just get to be, it's just, there's only so much human body can handle. Exactly. You know, at some point, shit, shit's going to fall apart. What are some things that you've learned about uh, recovery over the years? Um, I think, I think, I think the biggest thing with recovery is properly, properly, excuse me, periodizing your program more so than anything. So a lot of like people are going to get into like, I did like a contrast shower this week, but you know, I was out drinking three nights. Don't be be out drinking, be out periodizing your program, Mm -hmm. you you know, because everything's going to, there's a cost in everything because even, you know, some of the recovery modalities can actually affect your muscle hypertrophy because the natural inflammation process would spark the hypertrophy. So you got to be careful with, you know, doing too many of those like so-called recovery modalities. Right. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it's going to be, you know, it's going to come out like say 90% of it's properly periodizing your program, right. then taking care of business outside of the weight room. So a lot of stuff's fun to do, but to be the best, you can be strength wise. You're going to have to make sacrifices to do it. It's just that simple. Injuries. Have you had to deal with any that really um, derailed things or they had to work around or? I've had a couple elbow surgeries on my left elbow, but other than that, I haven't really had any major injuries. And I think that's simply um, was. Uh, like there, I think it's genetic partially because my, some of my parents have had arthritis. And, and then, um, I also think it's a lot of, was making some bad decisions. For instance, like, um, I got too caught up in pursuing assistance exercises. So like, I'd say like, all right, Kazmaier did this much on tricep extensions. Right. Yeah. I'm going to beat that. Uh. Well, okay. If you're already, you know, benching, you know, say you're do- doing like 620 pounds, like I was doing. Does it matter if you're skull crushing 315? You know, at right. that, some point, it just becomes stupid. And you're doing it for the sake of doing it. Right. Where it's all got to, the, the buck's got to stop at the bench. If it's no longer helping that, you're doing it for the sake of that. And that's not smart for powerlifting. So that, that I've yeah. learned from that and been able to help that other gets people. It to be hard because you always think that, you know, you always think that the more work you do, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. And so it's hard to just, you bench and then you leave. You know, it's hard, yeah. it's hard to do that, but like. For me, with my elbow, the way it flares up and stuff, I can literally bench. I'm good for like once a week, and I can I can pile up a lot of benching on that one day, and then I gotta just stop. yeah, and I gotta think, okay, what are two things I could do uh, to finish up and leave here without permanently fucking myself up? Well, you gotta think also like you made a good point about things <coughs> not being relative. Like, so if somebody mildly strong can do tricep extensions with 60 pound dumbbells, yeah. is someone that has benched three times as much can be doing 180s? I, I don't think so. You know what right. I mean? So yeah. Things aren't just like people talk about. That's the problem with percentages. They make it the same for strong people and the same for weak people if you're not individually adjusting it to what people need. Use percentages with the people that you work with? Uh Uh-uh. You just give them a set and rep range? Exactly. So it's going to be. And you give them weights? I give them the weights too. So. But it's gonna. That's the problem with percentages. Is it's gonna. It it, it demands the strongest people make the biggest jumps. Right. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So like. Oh yeah, it's jumped five percent this week. Well, you're squatting a thousand pounds. It's a lot, you know. Yeah, it's a little bit the same of, of counting your your macronutrients, right? Like different yeah. people have different ways of like adjusting that. Some a bodybuilding coach might say, "Hey, you know, just just count all your calories and and we'll be good." And somebody well, else might say, "Hey, you know what? I'm not going to ask you to count any calories. I'm just going to portion everything out for you. Here's what you eat: eight ounces of this, four ounces of that, one cup of that, and so on. And it's all drilled out." That guy calculated some of the stuff. So you're probably still calculating estimations of, sure. you know, like, oh, 75%. Okay, like, he should probably use about this weight. Yeah, I think the big difference is, you know, and I've talked about this in, like, seminars and stuff, is, like, a beginner can do a 5x5 five five at, like, 80%. That's, like, pretty normal. But, like, Mark can't bench 5x5 five five at 80%. It's just too heavy. Yeah, because you're more – and the thing is, like, even to take it a step further, is uh, Fred Hatfield actually did an experiment of people, and he had them do 80% of their max – or like in a b- various different lifts of like for max reps, the range of was basically in the group of about a hundred people was four to twenty one. Right. Oh. So if huge. I said do eighty percent for five by five, the guy does it for four ain't gonna get one set. Yeah. The guy that does it for twenty one just can yeah. carry on a conversation. And it depends by lift. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Squat, bench, deadlift is gonna be very exactly. different. Exactly. Yeah. It's like uh, I think they refer to that as like neurological inefficiency. Like the mm-hmm. person that can do. 21 reps is not able to recruit the same motor yeah. units when they do the single. Well, they may have a hell of a lot less fast twitch to yeah. recruit in the first place. Yeah, right. Yeah. They have more slow just twitch. Not good or bad, but you just got to adjust just, by that person. Yeah. You got to adjust by that person. Yeah. So that's that's genetics rule. And, and, well, that's what they say. Okay, so back in the day, you guys remember like fast, they would have like these – people talking about hard gainer magazines and all this group of like right. writers that were writing about hard gainers they'd make it sound like all right you like one set to failure like a hit program and you're a hard gainer you get better it's not yeah. true 
they need more volume because, like you said, they're neurologically inefficient, so they're yeah. not even taxing themselves with one set. Yeah. They need to be more volume, more frequency. Yeah, they're like the dirt. fast gainers need to be less and less frequency. Right. Tell us about Fred Hatfield a little bit. Uh, I think Fred Hatfield's probably the smartest person in the history of the Iron Game. He um, he's come up with so many ideas that were so far ahead of his time. Doctor Squat, right? And, and they're not just you know they're actually theoretical, but they're also like you know all experimented. Yeah, actually garage. have a PhD in squats. <laughs> <laughs> he actually does have a PhD, but I don't know if it's in squats. Uh, yeah, but. yeah. Did he just squat? He's a, is he uh, one of the first guys to squat a thousand pounds? He's the second person to do it officially. Right. He's a um, co-founder of ISSA, the Personal Training Certification. Right. And um, he's still active in the game. Him and I uh, do a lot of seminars together. We do about oh, one a month. Cool. That's awesome. How did you meet up with him? Um, he uh, well, I did some. I've done a lot of work with ISSA, mm-hmm. so um, I was redoing one of their textbooks. And he proofread it and liked it, so then he got in contact oh, with me. Oh, so you ran into him later on? Yeah. How the fuck did you but bench? But I read all his books before. How, <laughs> how the fuck did you bench 600 pounds? Did you have a coach then? Um, I had worked with a lot of people. I just figured it out myself for the most part. Like, so I like the guy I told you about earlier. You started lifting when you were 12. So Steve like Hall, a, the guy I told you about. Training, like, okay. All these people, I'd pick up things from here and there. Right. But then when I did the 600 from basically about like from 405 on to 600, I didn't have a coach. Yeah. but i had a lot of people help me that's you know i'm not one of these people i'm like self-made no one helped me no a lot of people helped. you me. had a lot of help and assistance and i'd call and people like ed Cohn and ask him hey this is like mm-hmm. happening so what do you think he'd give yeah. me a little advice here and there so it wasn't like just you know my genius i had a lot of help from a lot of people right i was mentioning uh mentioned many times before that you were you know putting out you and your brother putting out videos you know, long before YouTube was around, uh, way before I ever put out any videos. And it was an inspiration to me to see a lot of those lifts and see your brother do the cra- crazy ass like plyometrics and stuff. Yeah. Um, why were you guys like, why did you feel that was important to like document some of that stuff back then? I mean, it's before everybody else doing it. Now it's a cool thing to do. So everybody just does it. Because I couldn't sing or dance. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, That's Rocky Balboa. Yeah, 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 yeah. You remember, you saw that. Yeah. Uh, so um, <coughs> I think it was a lot of part was. Um, I was um, starting to train people, like, oh, okay. and so I needed like um, to like. Ba- since at that Ver- point I had my, I didn't have a master's yeah. degree or anything yet, so I needed to kind of like verify that I knew what I was doing and right, like right. actually apply it. So it was like to help people, like, share the information I had, and then to you know obviously to help business too. Right. Very cool. So that was it. Do you guys have any other questions for him? No, I think we're good. You got anything else you want to mention, Josh? Looking mm-hmm. forward to trying the Poke Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some good food. Uh, what's coming up for you? What's uh, what's kind of happening in uh, 2017? Um, Josh Bryant. Well, so far, um, got a schedule. I uh, got a couple seminars scheduled. We got one in the, um, Tallahassee in Jan- the end of January. Cool. Doing one at the Arnold Classic. Oh, and awesome. then um, you should come to that one. I you. should. Yeah. Uh, yeah and then um, yeah. got a couple new books coming out in the first of the year. So awesome. Pretty, Pretty excited cool. about that. I got a where lot of can, stuff coming up. Where can people find you? Um, come to you. The best place to find me, if you want to like learn more in depthly about what I do, is my website. It's joshstrength.com. Or if you're just kind of interested, like you're not really in big into reading a bunch of stuff, you just want to see some videos and stuff. Instagram, Jailhouse Strong. And then also at uh, your local gas station. At your local gas station <laughs> <laughs> on the closed circuit camera. <laughs> but do not try to fuck him up because you're going to get. We caught. put a lot of videos on YouTube too. So I got the Jailhouse Strong <coughs> YouTube, which is going to be more like. Actually, like coaching, talking, things like that. And then the I got my dad has one. It's Big Dan Forty Nine. It's just people lifting heavy weights. No commentary, no nothing. Just heavy. Does your dad flying. still lift? No. You and your brother get together and lift still here and there. I know he's you know he doesn't live near you, but when he when you do have a chance to hang out, do you yeah. train together? And we're actually we're actually twenty seventeen. We're running a meet together again in, in Texas. It's cool. called the oh, Pig Iron awesome. Classic. Oh, awesome. You guys uh, beat the shit out of each other a lot as as kids. Yeah, we we like we. <laughs> well, you were older, so you probably had one up on them all the time, right? We'd always. Uh, one of the last times we got in trouble with my parents is we were fighting at a donut shop and went through the window. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> how, how old are you? Like fifteen or something? No, we we're like ten or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's fighting yeah, over fi- fighting over glazed donut. You son I think of it was a bitch. coconut actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough when it's not candy glass too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, those are pretty good. All right, multiplier hustle, multiplier muscle, and may all your shits be tapered. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on Instagram and Twitter. Later.
Big shout out to all our sponsors, 8 Man Strong Apparel at 8 Man Strong, Bodybuilding.com for all your supplement needs, Complex USA for cutting edge muscle stem machines, Increase Your Bench, How Much Your Bench, that net. Power, The Only Strength Magazine, available in digital print at The Power Magazine, Mariel Tag for our number one cheerleader in the world, hey. and I'm Silent Mike, Instagram, Twitter, <coughs> YouTube. I'm the Jim McD everywhere that I want you to find me on the social medias follow the show on Instagram we are at Mark Bell's Powercast <laughs>